A huge display of the nation's military air power tonight at the Miramar Air Show. I'm Dwayne Brown. We'll have a look at the big show tonight on KPBS Evening Edition. And I'm Peggy Pico. A unique website for independent voters launches in San Diego. Coming up, we'll talk with its creator and find out why no party preference voters are the fastest growing constituents in the county. And we'll have the latest on the stalled talks between Orchestra Nova and the Musicians Union. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Irwin Jacobs and by Hello, good evening. Thanks for joining us. The largest military air show in the country is underway tonight at the Marine Corps Air Station Miramar. About half a million people are expected to watch the three-day event. It runs through Sunday and features the Blue Angels and hundreds of other aircraft and military personnel. The clouds and wet weather are moving out of San Diego just in time for this weekend's Miramar Air Show. Plan to get to the air show as early as you can, says Marine Lieutenant Colonel Stefan Marutis. We have a, more than enough stuff that you could do and see in a day. And in fact, you, uh, you could probably come the entire weekend and still not see everything fully. The crowds and traffic were so thick today, we had to speak to Marutis by phone. He says it's more than just flying acrobatics and a show of military might. The air show is also about recruiting the next generation of aviators and showing the public how their tax dollars are being spent. We have aircraft, we have ground vehicles, all kinds of military equipment, and standing in front are the uh, Marines who operate that equipment. And the crowd can come up, ask questions. You know, love interacting with the crowd. One of, and this happens a couple of times each year at the air show. Uh, I get a big kick, you know, inevitably a, a child will come up and, you know, big eyes and look at me and say, are you a pilot? You know, and you can just see the joy on their face. They're so excited to meet you. Lieutenant Colonel Marutis is a heavy lift aircraft pilot whose job is to transfer Humvees and large military pieces on the field of battle. He's been a Marine 17 years and says, as a kid, he was always interested in flying like the Blue Angels. I was big into models when I was a kid. And so I was always uh, very inspired by that. My father was in the Army. He was uh, in the Signal Corps, so, of course, that, that was part of my interest as well. And the theme of this year's show is Marines in Flight, celebrating 50 years of space exploration. This year we have over 120 different static display aircraft on the line. Uh, we have two Air Force B-52 bombers and a B-1 bomber, and we've grown year after year, which means, you know, bigger and bigger crowds and, and finding a place to park all those vehicles that come onto base has been a, a tremendous challenge. And if you plan on going to the Mir Miramar Air Show this weekend, the gates open at 8. The earlier you get there, the better chance you'll have of finding a place to park. Will the show go on for Orchestra Nova next weekend? There's still no contract between the orchestra and the musicians union. The first concert of the season is just over a week away. The musicians did agree to perform before talks broke down. Now, Orchestra Nova says if musicians promise not to strike, they won't lock them out. The union says no way. The two sides are at odds over the orchestra's proposal to hire musicians concert by concert. The union wants a yearly deal. San Diego home prices hit a four-year high last month, an average of $350,000. The tracking firm DataQuick says there's been a major change in the market mix with fewer foreclosures being resold, fewer lower price sales, and more sales in middle and upscale markets. Southwest Airlines says it's raising airfares because of rising costs. The increases are on a sliding scale. Two bucks each way for trips less than 501 miles, three dollars each way if you're flying up to a thousand miles, and five dollars if your destination is farther than that. A J.P. Morgan analyst says he expects most airlines to match the increase by tomorrow. United already raised fares earlier this week. 
The Coast Guard says someone left more than 3,000 pounds of marijuana floating off the San Diego coast. It was found Wednesday about 35 miles west of Mission Beach. Coast Guard says someone might have left it there uh, to be picked up later, or it might have gotten dumped after the owner spotted a Navy helicopter in the area. A scheme to fix University of San Diego basketball games led to a 30-month prison sentence today. Steve Goria pleaded guilty to betting on a game after a USD player was paid to influence it. Goria is one of 10 people indicted in the case, which also involves charges of drug trafficking. Two USD players and a former assistant coach are among the accused. The Obama administration has approved more than 4,500 young illegal immigrants for a program. It allows them to stay in the U.S. and get a work permit. Some are from San Diego. KPBS Fronteras reporter Adrian Florido spoke with one of them. Anna Mendoza, thanks for joining me. Uh, so tell me, first, I'd kind of like to ask you to take me back to June 15th of this year when President Obama announced his Deferred Action Program. Uh, what was that day like for you? How did you find out that you might be eligible for this program? Um, actually, my parents called me because um, I was at home, but I hadn't seen anything. So they called me and told me, and I researched it. And uh, it was sort of a sense of, okay, yeah, I can finally, I can finally work and you know start my career. So it definitely was a great sense of happiness for me and my family too, because they were very supportive from the very beginning. Uh, the main requirement uh, to qualify for this day of deportation is that you have to have arrived in the U.S. as a child. You're 24 now, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. But you came here when you were how old? I was two years old. And do you know kind of the circumstances be be uh, behind how, how you got here? Uh, those circumstances are very vague for me because I haven't really talked to my parents about it. But I do know that we came here to find better opportunities. One of the big benefits of this program is that it uh, allows you to get a job. And I bet at the age of 24, um, never having had a job before, that probably is kind of a, a huge step, right? Oh, yes. I, you know, I've done internships, but it nev it's never quite the same as getting a real job. So that's definitely something that I'm looking forward to. What sorts of uh, career opportunities are you interested in? I studied public relations, so that's something that I'm very passionate about. So I'm looking into firms that are hiring for public relations. And you just recently found out that you had actually been approved for this program, right? I assume you were probably one of the first uh, deferred action uh, applicants to get your application into the government. Yes, I sent my application in a week after the program opened, and I received my approval. I received a message last week. And I received my card on Wednesday. So what does the card look like? Uh, it's, it's just like a government issued ID. It's, it says that you know, I'm employed, I'm able to work here. And it also says that it's not valid for reentry. Not valid for reentry, meaning mm -hmm. you can't leave the country. I can't leave the country. But um, in some ways, it's probably better than anything you've ever had before, right? Yes, yes, because I can give that to an employer and it says that I legally am allowed to work here in the United States. So what was that like, opening that envelope for the first time and seeing that kind of first sort of official document from the U.S. government that you've ever had in your life that allows you some kind of, um, you know, some kind of uh, status here that allows you to do more than just like, kind of live in the shadows, you know? It was very o overwhelming. I, I, actually, I actually haven't really processed it because it's been it's been two days so I, I was very happy and I just wanna I kinda had a sense of okay now I have to hurry and find a job and you know show that I do wanna stay here and work and be a a good member of society. I mean, you certainly have processed it, I bet, more than a lot of people have, because you so. <laughs> uh, have come here to the studio today directly from three job interviews, right? Oh, yes. So it's uh, overwhelming again, but I'm very happy. And So where, where were your interviews this, this morning? I had three interviews. Uh, they were at Keystone Marketing, Boom Marketing, and GQ Marketing. And it went well? They all went well, yes. I have two callbacks. So when will you find out whether you uh, got the job? It's a three-interview process, so I am in the second interview process. Well, good luck. Mm -hmm. Good Thank luck. You. Anna Mendoza, thanks for joining me. The federal government's approved a plan to streamline solar development in the West. They've set aside nearly 300,000 acres of public land as solar energy zones. The zones include land in Riverside and Imperial Counties. The new solar energy zones are near existing power lines in areas with fewer environmental concerns. 
City Heights is about 100 acres short of the city's goal for park space in the neighborhood. The community wants to build a new skate park, but there's no money for it. Recently, I spoke with Speak City Heights reporter Megan Burks about what's keeping dollars from flowing to the park poor communities like City Heights. Megan, tell us what's happening in City Heights. City Heights is a very dense community with a lot of large apartment complexes and very few parks. Residents have long fought for more open space there, but the cause really gained traction a couple of years ago when young skateboarders picked it up. They had been getting in trouble for skating near schools and libraries, so they started lobbying their council members for a park they could use. And why can't the city find money when it does for other communities? Parks are largely funded with fees levied on developers, and that money has to stay in the communities where they're generated. So if somebody goes in and builds a new housing tract in a suburb, the money that he or she pays has to go toward projects in that suburb. And, and what would you say, what is the uh, city doing to address the, the park shortage in City Heights now? The city is trying something new. It has invited community planning groups to compile a list of recommendations and present that to the mayor before he drafts his budget. In years past, they wouldn't have that opportunity until late in the budget cycle. And this new process is allowing them to see just how limited the city's budget is, and that knowledge shows them that they can go and apply for alternative funding. And where do we go from here? The community groups are working on their recommendations now, and they'll present them to the city in, late, in early November. KPBS Speak City Heights reporter Megan Burks. The Chargers have nearly sold out Monday night's home game against the Denver Broncos, so no blackout for San Diego fans. Right now, the Chargers are at the top of the AFC West with three wins and two losses. The Broncos are right behind them at two wins and three, three losses. A prominent pro-business political club has reversed its endorsement in San Diego County's only competitive superior court race. Ryan Grohowski from our investigations desk is here to tell us more about candidate Jim Miller and the club's change of heart. So who is the business group, Ryan, and why did they change their minds? The group is the San Diego Lincoln Club, an influential political group that supports pro-business candidates and ballot measures. Let me give you some background. The Lincoln Club endorsed Miller for a judicial seat back in March. Miller is a private practicing attorney, but he also worked as a fill-in judge for the courts. In the spring, he was removed from that position. The club says Miller was not upfront with them about his removal, and that is what led to their decision to remove their endorsement. And what was Miller's response? Miller said he thinks the Lincoln Club is working off of incorrect information, and he told me in an email that the issue is not over. So what happens to the club's endorsement? The club's board voted separately to instead endorse Miller's opponent, Robert Amador. Amador is a longtime deputy district attorney. And it's not common, is it, for someone to take back an endorsement? No, it's not. The fact that the club reversed their endorsement is very unusual. A club member told me they simply want to recommend the best candidate to voters. The board thought that candidate was Miller, but when they found later that he misrepresented facts, they said they had no choice but to rescind their endorsement. Ryan Grohowski with Investigative News Source. You can find more online at inewsource.org. About 300,000 registered voters in the county are not affiliated with a political party. Peggy Pico explains how a new political website will cater to independent voters in San Diego. Based in San Diego, the Independent Voter Network, or IVN, is an online news source for voters with no party preference or independence. The website quickly became a popular source for national and state political news since it began 10 months ago. Joining me to talk about the site's newest edition, a focus on San Diego politics, is IVN founder Chad Peace and Whitney Benjamin, a no party preferred voter in San Diego. Thank you both for joining me. Now, San Diego's registers of voter 
registrar of voters told me that the no party preference voters is the fastest growing group of constituents here in San Diego. Chad, is it just that San Diegans are, you know, particularly independent minded or is this a trend we're seeing across the nation and in the state? I think San Diegans are independent minded, but it's a trend throughout the state and the country. Um, particularly in the state, we just passed the nonpartisan open primary initiative, which changed our primary process to a nonpartisan process rather than a party controlled process. I think this will catalyze um, people maybe registering as independents, but I do want to emphasize that in, IVN is about independent minded voters, so that includes all of us Republicans, Democrats, Libertarians and people that are registered no party preference. Let's take a look at the breakdown. Um, this is from the California Secretary of State. They reported as of September, 43.3% of registered voters in the state are Democratic, 30.1% uh, are Republican, and the no party preference is 21.3% with 5.3% uh, being other. Now, Whitney, you're one of the no party preferred voters mm -hmm. living here in San Diego. Why did you decide to go that route? Um, I think it started in high school. I had a pretty proactive government teacher and U.S. history teacher, and I kind of became a little bit more passionate about politics and our our entire history as a country. And I felt like I couldn't at that time decide that I absolutely was always going to vote Republican or I was always going to absolutely vote Democratic. I felt like I didn't have enough information on the table, and now I'm in a spot where I feel like the parties are so polarized that I can't always vote one way. I think it depends for me by the topic and what's happening. So um, it, I happened to make that decision when I was 18 and it still is the right decision for me now. All right. And Chad, why did you start IVN? Well, we started IVN because I believe our political discourse, like the political parties, we see the congressional approval ratings around 10 percent and everybody talks about the partisanship on both sides of the aisle. We started IVN to, pr to provide a platform for communication where we can all start talking to each other instead of past one another. Uh, there's no litmus test on IVN. There's four simple etiquette guidelines. Don't attack each other, substantiate what you say, don't make partisan-based attacks. Um, if, if everyone follows these guidelines, we believe we can raise the level of discourse um, to, to a place where we can start coming to solutions that aren't based on party. I want to talk specifics about who's registered in uh, California, the county. So again, from the uh, California Secretary of State, our latest numbers are in the state there are 3.7 million registered voters, in the county 1.4 million, and in San Diego County of those 1.4 million, 300,000 are like Whitney, they uh, have no party affiliation. And again, this is a growing uh, number here. Um, where do you get your political information from, Whitney? Um, it definitely depends. Like, I'm really, I'm really busy, so I like reading USA Today, and I like, I get a lot of my information from Twitter. Even I used to read the UT every day, but now I don't. I feel like it's a little one-sided, and so you really have to search for news sources that give you a balanced viewpoint in it. Um, so on a daily basis, I'll look at the USA Today, I'll look at Wall Street Journal, I'll watch the Daily Show, and it just I'm busy and I want a fair um, choice when it comes to news. So it's good to hear about organizations like that where it feels like both sides are represented. And IVN, uh, IVN is, um, Chad, so it's, it's, tell me about who funds it and why you chose San Diego as your focus group for, for going a little bit more local. We'll start with the second question. We chose San Diego because we're based right here in San Diego. We have a small group. Uh, four of us just graduated from USD Law School actually this March. Uh, I know the dean and some of our professors aren't happy about us not taking the bar yet, but um, that's why we started here in San Diego. Um, and so we're launching a local prototype um, here because we, I, as you mentioned before, we are a very independent-minded group here. How are you funded? And we're funded by uh, FIVE, the Foundation for Independent Voter Education, is the publisher of IVN. So they're funded much like PBS through individuals, corporations, uh, unions, um, and but they have no say in the content that goes on the site. Um, and that's how we get our funding, just like PBS. All right. Unfortunately, we are out of time. So Chad and Whitney, thank you both for talking to me. Now, uh, viewers at home, you can find out more information about the Independent Voter Network on our website, kpbs.org.
Proposition 39 supporters have a simple message. A yes vote raises more than a billion dollars in new tax money from out-of-state companies, and half of it will help create green jobs over the next five years. But KPBS business and environment reporter Eric Anderson finds not everyone thinks it's a great idea. The most obvious question for San Francisco hedge fund manager Tom Steyer is why? Why is he bankrolling an initiative dealing with state tax law? I want to participate like everybody else in seeing California becoming a better place to live. Steyer has already fought and won a battle at California's ballot box. In 2010, he helped defeat Proposition 23. That measure would have rolled back California's landmark global warming law. Now he's putting $20 million of his own money into passing Proposition 39. It's about tax fairness. We are closing a loophole, but all we're asking out-of-state companies to do is to pay taxes on their income exactly the way that we do. And what that will do is it will bring into the state of California over a billion dollars every single year, and all from, uh, from companies from out-of-state. California voters are getting a chance to do what California lawmakers failed to do in 2009, San Diego State University professor Steve Gill says the legislature gave companies a choice of how to pay their corporate taxes. For years and years and years, we had a long tradition of using what's called a three-factor apportionment formula, which meant we look at three different factors that are economic drivers of income, sales, property, and payroll. California lawmakers changed the rules so corporate taxes could be based on sales only. Many California companies adopted the sales-only rule because it was cheaper. But the state didn't get rid of the old tax formula, and some out-of-state companies find that formula cheaper. Large multi-state companies that don't have a lot of payroll and property in California, but probably have a lot of sales. California is a very large state with a very large population. Clearly, they are disadvantaged by a single sales factor and would prefer to keep the old three-factor formula. Prop 39 would eliminate the choice and base corporate taxes on sales only. GM, Chrysler, Kimberly Clark, and International Paper all spoke out against the idea when the measure qualified for the ballot, prompting the Prop 39 camp to take out ads attacking that opposition. These companies are stepping all over California. They're fighting to keep a billion dollar corporate tax loophole that gives tax breaks to companies for shipping jobs out of state. But those large companies didn't have the stomach for an expensive ballot box fight in California. Co-sponsor Tom Steyer pulled the ad campaign when the companies dropped their opposition. Some huge major American corporations have sent us letters who we thought might be in opposition and who are prepared to try and, you know, debate, send us letters saying, you know what, it is tax fairness. We recognize what you're doing is correct. We have no intention of opposing you. Steyer says that allows him to focus on the positives and fixing two long-running California problems, tax revenue and jobs. He says the measure will generate a billion dollars more for a cash-starved state. It earmarks half that money for the creation of green jobs over five years. But both of those solutions make Richard Ryder shudder. He's the chair of San Diego Tax Fighters. Ryder says Prop 39 is a tax hike, plain and simple, and he thinks voters will see that. The last eight tax increases that have been on the ballot, statewide tax increases, each of which could have passed with a simple majority vote. A lot of people think it takes two-thirds. No, simple majority vote. The last eight tax increases statewide have failed. Six of the tax increases failed by double digits. Ryder says a tax hike won't dig the state out of its fiscal hole. He argues that California needs fiscal discipline, not more money. And he's not ready to let politicians steer a half a billion dollars a year into green energy projects. It's not like there's a bunch of wise pipe-smoking geniuses up there making those distributions. It's going to be people who respond to pressures in Sacramento. It's going to be people who respond to uh, political contributions. But critics like Ryder don't have the deep pockets to publicly oppose Prop 39. Ryder says he'll have to rely on voters seeing the measure for what it is. Make sure you check out the KPBS Voter Guide. It breaks down the big issues and measures into clear language with links to our stories and candidate bios. You can even take it to the polls on your smartphone. You can find the KPBS Voter Guide on, your, on our website at kpbs.org slash voter guide.
The space shuttle Endeavour is making her slow, steady trek toward the California Science Center in Los Angeles. How slow, you say? Try two miles an hour. A 160-wheel ground carrier is taking the Endeavour on her final journey. She's expected to arrive at the Science Center tomorrow, and she'll be open to the public on October 30th. Tonight in our public square, as part of our election coverage, we've brought you in-depth reports and analysis of major state propositions on November's ballot. Proposition 34 is the initiative to repeal California's death penalty. It's replaced with life in prison without the possibility of parole. It led to a heated online debate. On our KPBS website, Harry Street wrote, yes, the system is broken, but our government lawmakers need to fix it. To do away with the death penalty would be a crime in itself. Web user in exile responded, even if it were not broken, it should be discontinued. It doesn't serve any purpose as it doesn't prevent any crime. And web commenter, California Defender, took a different angle. He wrote the death penalty seems to be a blessing for many convicts of heinous crimes who welcome the escape. While commenter Willard pointed to innocent inmates, saying, Since 1973, over 130 people have been released from death rows throughout the country due to evidence of their wrongful convictions. You can join in this conversation or comment on other KPBS news stories by following us on Twitter, liking us on Facebook, or just email us at publicsquare at kpbs.org. And you can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. You have a great weekend.